Good morning, everybody. I'm Marit Peterson. I am the Director of Education at the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. And I want to welcome you to our conversation regarding telephonic advocacy. We recognize that a lot of folks are shifting from in-person engagement with participants to telephonic or web-based advocacy modes. And because this is a model that we routinely use at the Minnesota Elder Justice Center in our advocacy, we thought we'd just take a moment to share some top tips um, or best practices for effectively engaging with participants over the telephone. Uh, to do that today, I would like to welcome Sarah Green. Sarah is our advocacy program coordinator at the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. And Sarah's going to talk with me today about telephonic best practices and approaches um, within the advocacy program at MEJC. We also both want to thank uh, Betsy Mavison, who helped Sarah and I identify these telephonic strategies and best practices. So welcome, Sarah. Marit, thanks for the opportunity to talk about best practices and victim services, especially right now with uh, the COVID-19 issues um, in front of us. I think it's a great time to have this, this interview together, this conversation. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so let's get started. And uh, I've structured these questions kind of loosely around the way that a call might unfold from beginning to end, or I guess beginning, middle, end. Um, so first, uh, even before the call starts, let me ask you about what you do before a call. Uh, are there things you'd like to do to prepare your space or things that you like to have ready before you begin a phone call with a participant? Mara, yeah, thanks. I think that preparation is really important. For me, it definitely is because it um, sets a tone and helps me make sure I have the information I need. Um, so I start by reviewing um, the information that was provided to us by the part by the program participant um, you know whether that was in a phone call or written regardless um, I will start by identifying some issues that they're laying out for us perhaps housing legal needs um, medical issues and I'll start writing notes at that point just jotting down a quick outline of those issues that the participant is laying out for us with some room to fill them in during the phone call. So that's my first step and I, I use those notes from the information provided by the participant to, uh, and I then take a moment to look at a short reference referral sheet that I keep close at hand. It's uh, uh, something that's very useful for me so I don't have to look up often used referral resources over and over again. Um, and so I'll take a look at that to see how it might align with the information that's provi been provided by the program participant. And there may be some issues in there that are new or unfamiliar to me or for which I don't have um, a referral resource to offer or all of those issues may arise. And so I like to take a little time to get on the internet and do a little research if, if I'm seeing some gaps in my own knowledge or referral resources. Um, and uh, that's, that's how I tend to, to uh, prepare for a call. And then uh, Sarah, when you are preparing for a call, um, are there other things that you're doing as you're, as you're preparing the space and the materials that you'll need um, with regard to the, the participants' um, circumstances, um, in terms of just understanding uh, where they might be at when you commence that uh, phone call with them? Yes, Marit, I've kind of built up, built up this habit that I think of uh, loosely as checking myself uh, before I start the call. Uh, for me, I am one of the tools of advocacy and an important one in terms of being able to provide compassionate listening for our participant. Um, sometimes um, compassionate listening is the most um, important uh, um, takeaway for our caller uh, from our conversation. And so I really do think of that as a key component of what we're trying to offer um, at Minnesota Elder Justice Center. And so I'll check myself um, and typically for me, um, I like to just take a few cleansing breaths, look around me to see if I need a cup of hot tea, to see if my, my space is pretty calm and organized. And um, in that way, 
um, I'm reminding myself to uh, access my compassionate listener um, before I dial the phone. Absolutely. And then in terms of the circumstances for callers, um, I, I'm, I'm interested in what strategies you use, uh, even as you are expressing that compassionate listening, um, are there tonal strategies that you use or um, uh, other, uh, other, other communication techniques um, as you are actually engaging with somebody on the phone to demonstrate that compassion? I think this is a really important point that you're asking about because it's about um, uh, meeting that participant where they're at and remembering that everyone's an individual and their circumstances are going to be unique to them. And so I, I, I roughly think of this as meeting that participant where they're at. And so the tone um, that I'll use will be different depending on that person, their circumstances, and kind of the personality they're presenting um, as far as their needs go. But I think the important point that, that you're making with your question is that I'm aware of my tone and that I'm aware of helping that person to feel like I'm listening to their, their unique circumstances. Thank you, Sarah. So I did hear you talk about structuring an outline in notes before you begin the call so that you have some sense for um, maybe some of the issues that are going to arise. Do you then also take notes while you are speaking with participants? Yeah, um, the outline that I create is, is simple and rough of, of issues that are presented, but it is um, an important guide for me throughout the conversation. Um, so I do, I do take notes throughout. Um, I usually begin each call by um, talking with folks about um, what they can expect from the conversation and um, framing uh, their expectations in this way, talking about um, you know, uh, how we usually uh, proceed in a phone call is, is by having them tell us their circumstances if they're able and willing, and um, that we'll talk about referral resources and helping them to organize um, and develop a, a action plan as well. So um, all of that is, is something that I'm gonna wanna keep notes about. Um, as I use my rough outline, um, after I give that initial framework to the participant, I then ask them um, if they're ready to have a conversation with me, if it's good timing. Um, and I try and create some safe space in that way by asking them if it's good timing and if, if they're okay with telling me um, the circumstances that they're experiencing and um, then proceed by letting them lead the way. And, um, and as I'm listening, I'll be filling out my notes around and I try and organize those by uh, roughly by the issues that were presented or by adding new issues um, onto the outline. Speaking of those, um, that structure, thank you, Sarah, uh, around the issue spotting piece, I'm just interested in if there are other specific things you do related to issue spotting, particularly when we're talking about safety issues. We know that sometimes um, callers will call presenting one issue, but your experience allows you to recognize that other issues may be significant. Um, how do you communicate with callers about that or even organize those thoughts in your own, um, in your own uh, way? Many callers uh, will contact us um, and not have uh, been able to, to even roughly organize the many issues that are connected, typically connected to elder abuse and neglect. And, and, um, and so I uh, believe that one of the things that we offer them that's valuable is the ability to organize um, and so um, what I like to do um, is uh, listen to folks and I'm thinking about um, filling out those, those um, issues that we were talking about in the outline, but also about prioritizing and um, safety comes up as um, a top priority. And um, so as folks are talking about the various issues, I try and help them uh, reframe as needed. Um, you know, if, it, if the issue is somewhat confused for them uh, in terms of, you know, perhaps, for example, we've got 
um, a loved one at home with diminishing capacity, whose capacity is, uh, you know, unclear to them and different on any given day, along with, um, you know, some concerns about vulnerabilities, manipulation, and exploitation. So we've got a variety of issues in front of us. Um, I try and pull those apart into sub-issues. So, and the purpose of that is being able to help that person remember how to take their next steps and what the systems are that they've got to contend with in getting help for that individual. With the issue of safety uh, rising to the top, Mara, that may be more than you intended to ask me, but there's the answer to your question about safety. Well, I appreciate that tremendously. And I really know, I know we reflect a lot together about um, as a as a as an organization about um, prioritizing safety, but also helping to create that structure of priorities. So I really appreciate that you brought that forward. Absolutely. Um, the I've got a couple more questions I'd like to ask. First, I want to ask if there are specific considerations, Sarah, that you make when the call comes from someone other than the victim or potential victim, him or herself. So at the Elder Justice Center, just for background, folks, we're working with people who are concerned about either an experience of abuse, neglect, or exploitation they've had, or the potential for that experience. Mm -hmm. We talk about victimization. Those are the experiences we're typically referring to. Um, but, but Sarah, what do you do when you get a phone call from a third party? Yeah, we, we get probably um, almost, I would say two thirds of our calls are either from concerned family members or neighbors or they may be from professionals looking for technical assistance. But in all those cases, um, folks are telling me about circumstances and they, they may include, um, while they're talking to me, how the person they're concerned about feels. And some folks will not naturally bring uh, that information out in the conversation. So if that information about where is the voice of the person of concern in this conversation? If I'm not getting that information, I'm gonna, if I need to, I'm gonna write a note to myself um, and to ask for that at an appropriate time. And so I will be sure to ask, um, how does the, how does your loved one or or your client, the person of concern, feel about whatever the topic is we're talking about and make sure that I'm gathering information about that person's voice as we go through the conversation. And if it's not, again, if it's not naturally forthcoming, I'm gonna ask um, if that individual, if the person of concern is in a place uh, to give me a call or to give us, our organization, a call uh, to talk about the, the situation. And um, sometimes it'll become clear that that individual um, is maybe uh, intubated in a hospital setting where they can't talk or maybe uh, they're in late stage Alzheimer's and, and just aren't in a position to give us a call directly. But if that information doesn't come to me, I like to check on it. Um, and that is again about, as you indicated, keeping the victim at the center of the conversation. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate that. I think that's actually a great message to con conclude on. I do, I do just want to ask any um, strategies that you use as you are concluding the phone call I'm getting ready to, to um, end the conversation, at least for the time being. Um, how, what are your preferences with regard to concluding a call? Yeah, I actually think of it as a three-step process. It goes pretty quickly. Um, throughout the call, I will have uh, tried to remind that into the caller, the participant, about um, some of the framing and the strategies that we've been working on. But at the end, I like to quickly review everything, maybe not so quickly, depending on the individual and their ability to take that information in. Um, and I'll check with them uh, as I'm doing this, but I will uh, review the outline of issues, the referrals that we um, identified together, and, the, um, and just the information that might help them moving forward. Um, so that's kind of the first aspect of, of heading to wrap up for me. And then the second thing I like to do with folks is uh, just check in with them, give them an opportunity to uh, tell me if there's anything else that they wanted to discuss. Um, and I apologize, my phone's going off. Uh, so um, 
so I, yep, I want to hear from them and that helps them feel finished as well and not feel like I'm uh, running the whole show. And then um, finally, I look at just leaving them with um, some encouragement. Um, depending on the individual and where they're at, I almost, but I almost always will thank the person for giving us a call um, and uh, thank them for, you know, what they're doing in their lives um, and um, let them know that it was my pleasure to talk with them. Uh, and also if there's, you know, some harder issues going on for that individual, I might add some additional encouragement uh, for them around, um, you know, support for them that we may have talked about during the conversation. Well, thank you, Sarah, that's tremendous advice. And I really am just very grateful to hear your perspective on telephonic advocacy. I'm excited to be able to share that with our partners in this conversation. And I'm just really, again, grateful uh, to you for sharing your own expertise about how to meaningfully engage with participants on this platform. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mara. It's really my pleasure. We love the work we do and we love talking with people about it if people want to reach out to us as well. Awesome. To that end, I would just encourage folks, uh, if you have questions, if you need advocacy, if you would like to have some technical assistance uh, from Sarah or from our advocacy team, please feel free to call us. You can reach us at 651-440-9305. Again, 651-440-9305 is our phone number. Or you can visit our website where you can find information like this at www.elderjusticemn.org. Again, www.elderjusticemn.org. And Sarah, thank you again, and thanks everybody for listening.